questions for you. Um, but as Christian said, my name is Ross Overstreet. I am the extension agent here in Lamar County. My office is in Purvis. Um, happy to help out here in the Southeast District. Uh, glad to be a part of this series that Christian has uh, started on the Zoom meeting since uh, the coronavirus kind of took over the airwaves uh, and kind of limited what the ways we can uh, present educational workshops and information. So a um, little bit about fire ants in general. Um, they typically uh, mobile as uh, kind of the, the epicenter of what, what's kind of given the honor of being the, the home or the entry point of fire ants in the Southeast. Uh, usually came in around 1918 um, is to their best guess. Um, thankfully, Mobile, they're kind of good for, they've given us Kogan grass and fire ants. So, um, you know, we're thankful for that, I guess. Um, there are two species of fire ants in Mississippi. There are obviously more species of just ants in general in Mississippi, but as far as fire ants are concerned, we do have the red imported and some areas do have a black imported fire ant. Um, the red imported fire ant is the, typically the most common one that we have in our lawns, in our gardens. Um, ones that typically we have more of an issue with here um, in Lamar County and South Mississippi. Um, the colonies can get rather large and be rather numerous. Um, there can be anywhere from 50 up to 200 mounds or colonies per acre in a very, very extreme case uh, when left unchecked and unmanaged. Uh, and each colony can go from anywhere from a few thousand ants all the way up to 200,000 individuals within that colony. So uh, you're dealing with a very large, um, large group of individuals um, and kind of like we mentioned with when I went over with the honeybees and the beekeeping thing uh, typically you only have one uh, fertile individual and that's the queen she's typically the only one that lays eggs within that colony um, so Typically, if we can control the queen, that's kind of the way we um, kind of control the colonies and keep the spread down. So um, understanding that and understanding how they feed uh, kind of kind of will help uh, help us manage more mounds and more colonies, uh, prevent the spread of them. So. Um, Basically, again, um, when they're feeding, when, when fire ants feed, they can't eat solid objects. So typically what happens is the worker ants, worker, which are females as well, um, just like in the honeybees, um, they will go out, forage, collect food, bring it back to the nest, and the more advanced or the more later stage larva will digest that food, will convert it into a usable form, and then the worker ants and the larva, will, it will then be spread throughout the, the colony um, and fed to the rest of the members um, or individuals within that group. So um, they have to come bring it home and kind of process it before they can actually eat it. So that's why uh, you see typically when the ants are feeding on leaves or insects or uh, whatever it may be, you see they're taking rather large chunks back to their colony, rather large pieces, uh, and not eating it on site. So um, that's kind of the way we manage um, colonies is we take advantage of that situation um, and give them a food source that they take back that is then um, has a chemical uh, component to it that is um, detrimental to their health um, or, and deadly to them. So we have a couple of options when it comes to control. We have baits and we have mound treatments. Um, and each one of those has its own drawbacks and limitations and uh, downsides and pros and cons and good things. But um, typically baits are what's gonna give us the most bang for the buck. This is the one that we recommend more than anything is to use a bait uh, preemptively, uh, preventatively. Um, 
you know, they're going to be the ones that you only have to apply a couple of times a year, yet they're going to control the majority of your colonies or mounds. So less work, more control, better control. Um, to me, that's a win-win situation. So uh, when we're using baits, we can, there are a few things that we kind of need to think about. One of them is being that it is slow acting. They are slow acting typically. There are some baits that are faster acting than other baits, but in general, that we kind of consider them all to be slow acting compared to the mound treatments. So uh, typically we're gonna broadcast these at very, relatively low rates using a hand spreader or a push spreader or something like that. Um, you know, just a small implement to help us distribute it evenly over a given area. A lot of times these rates are going to be anywhere from half a pound up to two to three pounds per acre. It depends on the product that's, that, that you have available to you and the product that you choose to use. Um, sometimes it can be more than that, but typically anywhere from about a half a pound to two to three pounds per acre. So a uh, very low amount of actual active ingredient and actual chemical that you're putting out to control. Um, and you can see here we're getting typically 80 to 90 percent control of mounds using just baits. Um, so want to apply these two to three times per year. Uh, we use typically in the here in extension we like to recommend kind of our reminders as being the Easter, 4th of July, and Labor Day as our reminders to put out the baits. Uh, and then in between those times, obviously, you'll want to do some individual mound treatment controls uh, for those that kind of either escape the, the bait, the luring of the baits, or, you know, you're, you know, there's some that may be moved in after you applied the baits or after we were, it rained or something like that that has made the bait ineffective. So um, one way to kind of tell when you would like to put out these baits is to use what we like, or I like to call the potato chip method. Uh, this basically, you just want to set out a uh, couple of just Lay's plain potato chips, not barbecue or salt and vinegar or anything like that, just the salted Lay's or, you know, plain potato chips. Set a couple of those out somewhere in an area uh, that ants can reach. Uh, and that kind of gives you an idea whether or not um, the, the ants are out foraging. So if as long as they're out foraging, that would that is typically a good time to apply the bait. Now again, if it's a day like today or yesterday where we're expecting a good bit of rain, you may not want to put it out just yet. You may want to wait until we're looking at a, a few consecutive days of decent weather and um, you know not ex extremely cold. That's one thing that um, fire ants aren't a big fan of. They don't really go out foraging too much when it's real cold or when it's raining out. So kind of want the temperature up between 70 and 90, 95 degrees, somewhere around in there, um, and kind of clear kind of clear weather. So just something to think about, uh, kind of an easy way to, um, to monitor for that foraging activity. Obviously, if they're not out foraging and bringing that bait back into the colony, uh, it's not doing you any good. So you don't want to waste that stuff. Some of these can be rather ex expensive, but uh, again, if you can get 80 to 90 percent control out of something, um, you're going you're going to be pretty pleased with the results, I believe. So, especially with the if you have a bad bad infestation or a bad problem with them, where multiple mounds, um, you know, obviously it's a safety issue um, with our kids, our animals, ourselves. Uh, it's also can be a be yeah, a hazard to our lawnmower blades and some weed eaters or whatever, you know, we're mowing those mounds and dulling our blades, therefore getting a less good quality of cut from our mower and that's gonna cause other problems. And so it can just be a be a lose-lose situation just having ants around in general. But there are a few baits that are available to homeowners for use in the home lawn. Typically, these baits are not labeled for vegetable gardens. Um, so they're not available or not typically to be used directly within the garden. Um, but the good thing about baits are is that you don't necessarily have to put them on the mound itself. 
there were the, the ants will go out forage for it, bring it back to the colony itself um, themselves. So uh, just applying these in a, you know, 50 to 70 foot wide band around the outside of the garden uh, and letting them go out forage and bring back what they're planning to use within the, or feed on within the colony uh, is, is perfectly fine. Um, now some of our, there may be a few of the, couple of these that are labeled, like the spinosad, I believe, is one that is labeled for use in the garden, um, but the rest of these I don't believe are. Um, now, once we get to the mound treatments, a, a majority of those are able to be used within the vegetable garden um, because the active ingredient in a lot of those are um, not all of them, but a lot of them are labeled to be used in on vegetables themselves. So um, again, there are a couple like asafate or surrender, uh, which is the common name, which you do not want to use within the garden on vegetables. Um, but you know, there are a couple, or there are a few that, that are available to be used within the vegetable garden. Um, a lot of these you're going to notice a couple, few of these on um, like the Amdro, um, Maybe the Advion may be kind of um, familiar to you. Uh, the spinosad um, is a very common insecticide that is used in vegetable production. Uh, it does a very good job on a lot of soft-bodied insects and things like that that are um, sometimes, and it can be typically labeled as organic. Um, a lot of formulations are labeled organic, not all of them. So uh, it is a relatively safe and, um, you know, when, when used judiciously, it is um, extremely safe. So um, it's usually very recommended, especially for um, beekeepers like it a lot because it's relatively safe for bees. Um, so it's another option. Uh, the Advion is going to be, or the Indoxicarb is a very, fast acting bait uh, within just a couple of days you're going to see a wide uh, reduction within the mound, number of mounds, uh, number of colonies where the spinosad is going to take you typically a few weeks, couple of, up to a couple of weeks to really start noticing a difference. So again they, the, the foraging ants have to go out, forage for it, get it, bring it back to the colony. The larvae have to um, digest or break down that um, that food product and then all of the individuals within it feed on it and that's what kills them so uh, once they ingest the, um, the chemical or you know whatever product it is you put out so uh, a lot of these products are basically just a carrier which is going to be like a grit or you know a, um, cornmeal or something like that and then they have an oil based product that is the attractant to uh, for the fire ants and then the third component is going to be the chemical itself which is actually what kills um, kills the fire ant so um, typically it's the the oil pro part of that product that or that product that is uh, that goes bad so when you're storing these things remember that um, and another option when I talked about the potato chip is if you have some of this, just set some of this out along with the potato chip. Um, and then if side by side, and then if there's ants on the, on the potato chip, but not on the bait, then you know the bait probably has gone rancid. The oil has probably gone rancid. Uh, so you probably need to dispose of that properly and then, um, purchase some new, but Typically, as long as you store this in a cool, dry spot uh, in a sealed container of some sort, whether it be a Tupperware or Ziploc bag, depending on how much of it you have, um, it will stay good for, for an extended period of time. So when do we want to use baits? Um, again, um, like I said, our reminders are typically Easter, 4th of July, and Labor Day. Again, we don't have to apply them on, that, on those exact dates. We just use those as kind of reminders um, as to how long and how often we should um, be putting these out. So 
Uh, once the temperature gets up above about 70 degrees is typically when we kind of want to start thinking about putting out a bait because again it's going to take a couple of weeks before it to really work so uh, once they begin act, be, being active uh, we can start applying these baits and start getting to, getting some early control before things get overwhelming on us um, again you want to use fresh bait because it is that oil product that's on that carrier that is attracting the baits so if you're not if it's not pleasing to them um, they're not going to want to try to bring it back to the to the colony to to eat. So um, just like us, you know, we don't want to use old rotten vegetables. You wouldn't attract me with a rotten um, rotten watermelon or anything like that. So um, you know, I want something that's going to be fresh and pleasing. So make sure you use fresh bait when possible and try to store it correctly. Uh, we don't want to do it when the when there is already wet outside. That's going to break down that oil component within that um, bait. Uh, we don't want to do it, obviously, right before a big rain either, because then it's just going to get washed away. Um, it's best to do it in the afternoon. That's typically when they're more active out foraging, uh, early afternoon through the af late afternoon before nightfall. Um, and then we want to make sure we retreat one good time before the fall. So. Typically, when we're seeing a lot of mounds is going to be in the spring and the fall when it's wet and cooler um, because they're using that sunlight to warm up the colony. So we're going to see those mounds getting built up uh, to, to attract that heat and to absorb that radiant heat from the sun and to keep the colony warm. And then in the heat of the summer when it's typically hot and dry, um, you usually won't see big mounds getting made just because they're going to be deeper in the soil, uh, trying to, uh, to, to stay cooler. Um, so typically we see the mounds in the spring and the fall when it's real wet, they're trying to move up to get the heat as well as get out of the water. Um, and then we're going to see less mounds, even though they're still there, uh, we're going to see less eyesore mounds during the heat of the summer. So the next thing we want to kind of look at um, uh, all right before I move on I can see a couple of questions over here um, don't see a best buy date on my old Amdro container how long before it's no longer effective still works every time as long as it's working um, you know it's, there's chemicals really don't go bad Per se, again, it's the oil or something in the bait that's going to go bad. So um, as long as you're still seeing the results that you want, I think it's still good. Just keep it dry. Keep it in a safe location, dry location, cool. Don't let it get rained on or, um, you know, a high humidity where it turns into a big clump. Um, and as long as you do that, you should be fine. Um, you know, if you're having to, if you've got a can of Amdro that you're using for, you know, 10 years, you don't have a very bad amp problem. So a lot of my products I use up pretty quick, which I've got a rather large uh, place to treat. But, um, you know, it's, I go through, through mound treatments pretty quick. So again, just the best by date doesn't really, doesn't really pertain as long as you store it correctly. So are any safe with pets in my fence yard where dogs go out? Uh, the spinosad um, is going to be one of the more safe ones, but obviously um, most all of these are going to be safe after a given amount of time, which will depend on the product you use. Uh, that information will be on the label. It will have a re-entry period. Uh, typically, most of these products are until dry. Uh, so you just want to keep your pets or your kids or children, whatever, um, from, from being in that area, or even yourself for that matter. Uh, you, you know, you want to make sure you don't re-enter that area until whatever the label states. Uh, and that's going to be different depending on the product that you purchase. Um, a lot of times it's either 24 hours, sometimes it's until dry, sometimes it's four hours. It, again, it just kind of depends on the product. So, um, but again, all that information can be found in the label. So I don't really wanna say 
it is this because it's all it's going to be different depending on the product um and yes you are correct uh miss marianne uh carbol or seven typically is no longer carbol uh you can find some of the older formulation that is still carbol but uh now the seven concentrate has ch been changed over to zeta um and this is kind of i need to update this slide i appreciate that uh and i will get that updated um and it is still i believe labeled for a liquid treatment even zeta cypromethrin is labeled for um for mound treatments individual mound treatment um on the seven label seven concentrate label so um these are just a couple of options uh the permethrin, the carbaryl, and the spinosad. These are individual mound treatments. So these are what we're gonna recommend you use either in between your bait treatments uh, for any escape or mounds or mounds that are popped up in between or at, you know, towards the end of your bait's life or uh, just something, or this may be an instance where you've got an activity or um, you know, you're having a little dinner party or something at your house uh, and you wanna get this done within the next few days. These act very, very quickly. A lot of times these are gonna be, um, you just mix up in a gallon or two of water, depending on the product. You know, it could be an ounce or three capfuls or whatever it recommends on the label. Um, it'll tell you to mix a certain amount in one to two gallons of water, and you wanna pour these directly over the mound and let it soak in. Uh, typically it's two gallons and you wanna take, you know, a third of that, make a ring around the outside of the mound to where you kind of trap that queen within the inside of that colony to where it can't escape, she can't escape out one of the tunnels um, and then pour the rest of it over the center of the mound. Um, and then that's gonna soak down in and, um, and kill, kill the col entire colony. Uh, so these are gonna be extremely fast acting, much more so than the baits. Um, and to me, they're just, you know, they work quicker, they're a little more troublesome than the dry mound treatments because you have to just either go back and remix up another couple of gallons of water, uh, go back to the water hose, go dump it over a mound, come back, remix up, go to another one. Uh, where with the individual dry mound treatments, you can just kind of sprinkle a tablespoon or two depending on what the label uh, states over the mound and either then water it in or let time it to where rain washes it in if it needs watering in. Some of the dry products do need to be watered in, but some of them do not. So again, it's important that you read the label. Um, so here's here a few options with the liquid treatments. Um, uh, I think, there we go. Um, there are a few dry mound treatments as well uh, that we have available to us. Um, Asaphate, which is Surrender or Orthene Fire Ant Killer, is a great one. Um, it stinks to high heavens, but it works quickly. Um, and you're gonna definitely smell it. Uh, but that's the, to me, that's the smell of something working. Um, you know, it's just something that I'm gonna have to deal with and I'm willing to deal with in, uh, in those instances. Uh, you know, obviously this isn't something that I would wanna pick if you are looking to have that dinner party or something like I was talking about. Um, it's going to kind of have that rotten egg smell, uh, something that may not be too pleasing for you and your guests, but it does work rather quickly. Uh, Cyflurethrin, Bayer Fire Ant Killer, and Delta Methrin, um, Bengal Ultra Dust Fire Ant Killer. These are good options. They're going to be a little slower acting than the Asaphate, um, but they will, they will work. Um, quite effectively. So uh, again, these are gonna be ones where, depending on the product that you buy, you're just going to sprinkle a given amount um, over the top of the mound, or some even say sprinkle around kind of a perimeter barrier around the edge of the mound. Um, so it's very important that you do read the label and follow that, uh, just to make sure that you're gonna see the results that you wanna see from from the product that you choose. So, um, you know, a lot of times we get complaints on from people saying some so and so didn't work well, and 
you know, well, I, I thought I did it right, but I didn't really read. And you come to find out they either watered it in and diluted the product or they didn't water it in and it just sat there and um, didn't do its job. So it's very important. Um, Uh, a couple of questions. Neighbors tell me the mounds run underground all down the road for a far distance. Is this true? Um, they will go underground for a little ways. I mean, they're not going to be, you know, miles underground. Um, they're all going to be within, you know, just a few, within a few square feet typically. Now they can go pretty deep depending upon the temperature and the ground moisture and things like that. Uh, if it's super dry and super, super hot, uh, they will tunnel pretty deep into the ground to find, get to a cooler area and where moisture may be. Um, but typically they're not going to be widespread as far as a very long distance. Um, now they may have some entrance tunnels that are outside of the mound a little ways, but for the most part, all of their, um, little tunnels and caves and, you know, little areas where they have the eggs are all going to be pretty, pretty lo located pretty much underneath the top of the mound, if, if you can see it. So, so uh, again, like I said, with pesticide use, make sure you read and follow all the label directions, read them closely, read them thoroughly, um, because the label is the law. I know I've preached on that a lot with any time I have given one of these presentations and had chemical recommendations, whether it be weed control for herbicides or um, fungicides for fungus controls, um, you know, things like that. It's, it's important that we follow these directions, um, not just for our safety, but for the environmental safety as well, as well as our neighbors and our pets as well. Uh, and all this information is in there. So um, make sure we require wear all the required PPE. A lot of times for a fire ant bait, it's gonna be just long pants and maybe some rubber gloves and long sleeve shirt and closed toe shoes. Um, obviously, if you're doing something with liquid, you, you know, you wanna make sure, probably wear safety glasses and things like that to where the liquid does not splash back up in your eyes. Um, but again, read and follow all the labels. It's all in there. Um, don't just guess and think that you know what you may need to be doing because it may, it is going to be different from product to product. Um, and same with the watering, required watering in afterwards. Um, you know, some products are going, even though it may be a dry product, the last dry product you used may not need it to be watered in and this time you're trying something new. Um, so you want to make sure that you're following the guidelines and following what it recommends to make sure you see the control that you want. Um, and again, store these pesticides in a cool, dry, safe place out of the reach of kids, out of the reach of your, uh, your animals to where they're not gnawing on the bags or get any bright ideas that it could be something that they're interested in. So we do have some excellent publications available to us through the Extension Service, uh, through the Mississippi State Extension Service, uh, P2429, Control Fire Ants in Your Yard, P2347. Uh, insect pests of the home vegetable garden and fire ant biology. Uh, and then there's just a couple of little websites that we have that Dr. Blake Layton, our entomologist, state ent entomologist has put together control of fire ants in around your home vegetable garden, little uh, just information page, not really a publication or anything. But um, if you go to the extension.msstatewebs.edu webpage and just search fire ant up in the top right hand corner search bar, uh, there will be a wide variety and a large, large compilation of fire ant materials available for you, to, no matter whether you got a hay field or a pasture or a vegetable garden or your lawn, whatever you're trying to treat it in, um, there you'll find something to your liking in there and th that'll help you choose what's best for you. So, um, like I said, just wanted to kind of give a brief overview. I knew it was a kind of a quick, short uh, presentation today. Um, you know, I don't, this is one of those topics, get a lot of questions on it, especially in the spring. Again, when we're starting to see a lot of the mounds, um, 
this time of year, we're probably about to start seeing a lot more mounds because of all the rain and getting them getting flushed up to the surface to escape all the water. Uh, but typically around this time, we start seeing our, our mounds kind of dissipate just because it's done got hot and dry and they've gone deeper into the ground. They're still there. We just don't see them and not quite as noticeable. So um, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me or obviously, you know, I'd prefer if you're not from Lamar County, at least go through your county agent first. Um, I don't want to try to step on anybody's toes, but, um, you know, be more than welcome to field any questions either by phone you see here or by email. Obviously, you can reach us on social media. Also, each county office has their own dedicated Facebook page as well as just the Mississippi State Extension as the um, mother organization. So, um, you know, they will they have a website and you're more than welcome to, to send us a message, post, make a post, or however you feel um, so inclined. So, 